Hello class, welcome to your lecture on spirit and nature in Buddhism, wherein we give a brief overview of the history of Buddhism for those who are new to its academic study, and then get into questions of Buddhism and ecology with Stephanie Katza, The Greening of Buddhism, and ending with a discussion of Buddhism and contemporary continental philosophy with Martin Heidegger. When it comes right down to it, Buddhism is probably an even more complicated major world religion than Christianity or Islam. Its philosophical traditions are rich and varied, and so are its major branches. And of course, it all goes back to the life of the Buddha. There are several really good documentaries on this, such as the Bettany Ann Hughes, Genius of the Ancient World series, The Buddha, and also a PBS documentary. And there are also some helpful supplemental links on the history of Buddhism and Buddhism in the environment in our course module. Situating the life of the Buddha in his historical context, roughly 538 to 463 BCE, means understanding the development of Buddhism from out of Hinduism at the time, specifically Axial Age, Upanishadic culture. How exactly Buddhism developed out of Hinduism, on what intellectual and spiritual foundation did this shift take place, is actually very well expressed in the opening chapter of Siddhartha by Hermann Hesse, Siddhartha Gautama being of course the name of the Buddha. Let's listen to a few moments, beginning with Govinda's love for the young Siddhartha. Siddhartha's eye and sweet voice, he loved his walk and the perfect decency of his movements. He loved everything Siddhartha did and said, and what he loved most was his spirit, his transcendent, fiery thoughts, his ardent will, his high calling. Siddhartha was thus loved by everyone. He was a source of joy for everybody. He was a delight for them all. But he, Siddhartha, was not a source of joy for himself. He found no delight in himself. Dreams and restless thoughts came into his mind, flowing from the water of the river, sparkling from the stars of the night. Melting from the beams of the sun, dreams came to him, and a restlessness of the soul, fuming from the sacrifices, breathing forth from the verses of the Rig Veda, being infused into him, drop by drop, from the teachings of the old Brahmins. He had started to suspect that his venerable father and his other teachers, that the wise Brahmins, had already revealed to him the most and best of their wisdom that they had already filled his expecting vessel with their richness, and the vessel was not full. The spirit was not content, the soul was not calm, the heart was not satisfied. The ablutions were good, but they were water. They did not wash off the sin, they did not heal the spirit's thirst, they did not relieve the fear in his heart. The sacrifices in the invocation of the gods were excellent, but was that all? Did the sacrifices give a happy fortune? And what about the gods? Was it really Prajapati who created the world? Was it not the Atman, he, the only one, the singular one? Were the gods not creations, created like me and you, subject to time, mortal? Was it therefore good? Was it right? Was it meaningful and the highest occupation to make offerings to the gods? For whom else were offerings to be made? Who else was to be worshipped but him, the only one, the Atman? And where was Atman to be found? Where did he reside? Where did his eternal heart beat? Where else but in one's own self, in its innermost part? in its indestructible part, which everyone had in himself. And where, where was this self, this innermost part, this ultimate part? It was not flesh and bone, it was neither thought nor consciousness. Thus the wisest ones taught, so where was it? To reach this place, the self, myself, the Atman, there was another way, which was worth while looking for? Alas, but nobody showed this way, nobody knew it, not the father, and not the teachers and the wise men, not the holy sacrificial songs. They knew everything, the Brahmins and their holy books, they knew everything, they had taken care of everything, and of more than everything, 
the creation of the world, the origin of speech, of food, of inhaling, of exhaling, the engagement of the senses, the acts of the gods. They knew infinitely much. But was it valuable to know all this, not knowing that one and only thing, the most important thing, the solely important thing? Surely many verses of the holy books, particularly in the Upanishads of Samaveda, spoke of this innermost and ultimate thing, wonderful verses. Your soul is the whole world was written there, and it was written that man in his sleep, in his deep sleep, would meet with his innermost part, and would reside in the Atman. Marvellous wisdom was in these verses. All knowledge of the wisest ones had been collected there in magic words, pure as honey collected from bees. No, not to be looked down upon was the tremendous amount of enlightenment which lay here, collected and preserved by innumerable generations of wise Brahmins. But where were the Brahmins, where the priests, where the wise men or penitents, who had succeeded in not just knowing this deepest of all knowledge, but also to live it? Where was the knowledgeable one who wove his spell to bring his familiarity with the Atman out of the sleep into the state of being awake, into the life, into every step of the way, into word and deed. Thus were Siddhartha's thoughts. This was his thirst. This was his suffering. Thus he spoke to himself from a Chandogaya Upanishad the words, Truly the name of the Brahman is Satyam. Verily, he who knows such a thing will enter the heavenly world every day. Often it seemed near the heavenly world, but never he had reached it completely, never he had quenched the ultimate thirst. And among the wise and wisest men he knew and whose instructions he had received, among all of them there was no one who had reached it completely, the heavenly world, who had quenched it completely, the eternal thirst. Truly the name of the Brahman is Satcham is how Hermann Hess summarizes the influence of the Upanishads on the young Siddhartha. And Hermann Hess, although a classic on the life of Siddhartha in the early 20th century, is really coming in the last wave of European and especially German philosophical interest in Buddhism. Buddhism began to be influential in the 19th century in Europe in the texts of Arthur Schopenhauer and the birth of the field of Indology. But the European perspective on Buddhism often betrayed certain fundamental misunderstandings Buddhism is very often seen as a life-negating or nihilistic religious philosophy. And so it's interesting that Hermann Hesse's depiction of Siddhartha and of the origin of Buddhism itself is in terms of a kind of engaged Hinduism. And this is really the separation between Buddhism and Hinduism. The spiritual liberation or moksha aimed at in the Upanishads is quite otherworldly. Buddha's task is not in fact to negate the world with his doctrine that life is suffering, but rather to accept that fundamental truth and thus engage the world. The label engaged Buddhism being something of a tautology. One of the greatest hyperboles of praise ever given by the scholars to the wise sages and greatest individuals of the past is to sum up their life by saying, he was born, he lived, and he died. But the power of this singular existence was such that the world was never the same again. This is how the philosophers speak of Aristotle or Socrates, the Christians of Jesus, the Muslims of Muhammad, and all the world of the life of the Buddha. Although not strictly a Buddhist scholar, Hermann Hesse's novel Siddhartha is as good a place as any for the Western mind and spirit to begin to attempt to understand the life of this singular individual, just as we might also begin from Karl Jaspers, Socrates, Buddha, and Jesus, the great philosophers, or Thich Nhat Hanh's The Heart of Buddhist Teaching. In Hesse's account, the key feature of the early life of Siddhartha Gautama is his pure immersion and enmeshment in the world of the Vedas and the Upanishads, of his father and ancestors, and thus in the spiritual life of the Hinduism of the great Brahmins or sages. Notice in Hesse's account, the very philosopher who will declare there is no self, an Atman, that life is suffering, and that even the self is impermanent, nirvana or enlightenment being an extinguishing even of the desire to be. 
is framed at the beginning of his quest as simply seeking after the true Atman, the heart of the teachings of the Upanishads. Although a heterodox religion with respect to Hinduism and its line after the Upanishads, Buddhist philosophy and religion emerged entirely within the context of the questions raised by the Upanishadic sages, such that the proper study of the Buddhist teachings and the Pali Canon can only really take place against the background of a close study of all the major Upanishadic concepts, above all Atman, Brahma, Karma, Maya, Samsara and Moksha. As Michael Malloy writes, India in the 5th century BCE was in a state of religious ferment. Great enthusiasm for personal religious experience led people to experiment with meditation, deep breathing, to study with gurus. A growing number of schools taught new ways of thinking, some of which opposed the priestly Vedic religion, that is the religion of Gautama's father. And into this world came Siddhartha Gautama, who had come to be known as the Buddha or the Awakened One. Son of a prince of the Shakya tribe in what is today Nepal in the lower Himalaya mountains, legend says that his mother Maya dreamt that a white elephant entered her side. This was the moment of conception of the future Buddha, and of the myth that Siddhartha was born miraculously from her side, like in myths concerning the immaculate conception of Jesus, and the wise old sages who tracked the place of his birth to declare him the Messiah. Similarly wise men noticed marks on the Buddha, which indicated he would either inherit his father's position, becoming a great king, a world ruler, or if he was exposed to the sight of suffering, he would become a great spiritual leader, a world teacher. And so goes the myth of Siddhartha's childhood and upbringing being almost entirely kept in captivity, in a kind of garden world with no hint of suffering or sin. Marrying early, he had a son and was educated in every way to take over his father's role as Brahmin priest responsible for officiating the rituals and carrying on the legacies and traditions of the Vedas. Various stories about his escape from the childhood paradise and compound float around. All the stories cohere that he went out to see the world and was moved by what are called the four passing sights. Coming across an old man, crooked and toothless, a sick man, wasted by disease, corpse being taken for cremation, and lastly, a sannyasin, or a wandering holy man, or renunciant who had no possessions and seemed to be at peace. At around the age of 29, he realized his life up until then had been a pleasant prison, and that for all his study and wonderful experience of life, he did not know the meaning of being human. Ceasing to enjoy the life he had, he decided to escape, cutting off his black hair, removing his jewels, and going forth into the world with nothing but questions. This is known as the great going forth. First, he sought teachers, learning what was left to learn of philosophy and practicing new ways of meditation. But still nothing satisfied him, and he became more and more known among the wandering sannyasins or sadhus as one capable of great asceticism in his spiritual quest and search for answers to his questions. Living on as little food as possible, some myths say, an almond a month, he eventually collapsed from weakness and found himself resting under a sacred tree tended by a kind woman. She offered him food, which he gladly accepted, but upon witnessing his rejection of asceticism, Siddhartha's companions and followers rejected him. He decided at this stage to adopt what's known as the middle way, neither extreme self-indulgence nor extreme asceticism. And later, during this period of his life, he went to sit down under another tree, the famous Bodhi tree, where he sat facing the east, resolving to remain there in meditation until he had all the understanding he needed. There is something to this sketchy biography already as a way of seeking enlightenment. Imagine if you had lived in almost perfect and luxury and well-being for 29 years, then almost killed yourself with extreme asceticisms, and had absorbed all wisdom and all knowledge from your culture, and then decided to recover from asceticism and eat at least a moderate and healthy diet. This might very well be enough to produce extreme visions and spiritual states. Various traditions, various details, but every version talks of the Buddha's struggle with hunger, thirst, doubt, and weakness. And some stories describe the work of an evil spirit, Mara, and his daughter who tempted Siddhartha with sensuality and fear. Like Christ in the desert, Siddhartha resisted all temptation in one particularly poignant moment, and at the peak of his own personal horror and torment by the Maras, 
Siddhartha touched his right hand to the earth, asking it to bear witness to his merit and eventual success. As Esposito notes, this earth-touching gesture, seen often in depictions of the Buddha, brought forth earthquakes and a cooling stream that washed away Mara and the hordes. Remember this important earth-touching gesture when you need it. Later that night, Siddhartha reached increasingly subtle and blissful perceptions, some say including the powers of levitation, telepathy, and visionary hearing across historical time space. Finally, he extinguished all desire and ignorance by fully realizing his capacity for insight and control over his prana, or life energy. These new abilities occurring poetically in the transition from night to daybreak. This was the great awakening or enlightenment achieved under the world tree, and it is all the residual details of a shamanic ordeal of initiation. The tree's thousands of leaves and twigs scintillate in their full beauty and radiance, but nevertheless, they too will die and change. And the full moon with its brilliant light will pass, but before it passes, it seems to stand still and stop as if for an eternity. The maras or seductive spirits of desire retreat and the Buddha is granted one full moment of equanimity and peace and scintillating profound insight. An awakening or bodhi nirvana in the extinguishing of the flame of desire has already been achieved and all that is left is to wake up and make the best of the days that remain to one. It is sometimes said that for seven weeks Buddha remained near the Bodhi tree enjoying the bliss of nirvana but this was another temptation. The Nagas, cobra or snake deity tempting him to remain in the revelry of his spiritual conquest. The cobra would come and use itself as an umbrella to protect Siddhartha from the rain. Here the Mara even cites humanity's hopeless stupidity as a reason to continue enjoying his own enlightenment. Interestingly, it is the high gods themselves that intervene and request that the Buddha live on and become a teacher of his doctrine, assuring him that people everywhere were capable of attaining enlightenment. Although he taught that even the gods were subject to samsara and rebirth, it is interesting that it is the great gods who inspire Buddha with compassion, karuna, helping him overcome his last temptation and becoming for the next 45 years the ultimate model of the engaged Buddhist. After this event, he fully abandoned his ascetic habits. He explained his awakening to five former companions in Deer Park near Benares and although they had parted from him earlier, they now reconciled with him and became his first disciples and the origin of the first Sangha or Buddhist community. And the Buddha spent the rest of his life traveling from village to village in Northeast India, teaching his insights and way of life. This period of his life is thought to have gone on and on for about 45 years. The Buddha teaching the middle path, the way of liberation far and wide and growing the monastic community. When he was 80, legend says, Buddha ate food offered by a well-meaning blacksmith, some say a mushroom, Buddha's last meal, which was spoiled and he became terribly sick. His final words of advice as his disciples weeped all around him, you must be your own lamps, be your own refuges. Take refuge in nothing outside yourself, hold firm to the truth as a lamp and a refuge, and do not look for refuge to anything else besides yourself. 2,500 years from now, this practice of taking refuge is akin to the Lord's Prayer and is the daily incantation at the start of any ritual. I go for refuge in the Buddha. I go for refuge in the teachings. I go for refuge in the community. For are these three things, the Buddha, the teaching, and the community, really anything different than one's own lamp and one's own self? And thereupon the Buddha died. Images of the reclining or restful Buddha emanating a peculiar kind of serenity, the original nirvana becomes in this farewell a para-nirvana, and thus the hope of a good death for the followers of the Buddha. What are the essential teachings of Buddhism? What is its philosophy, its religion? Well, that's pretty complicated. The guy was teaching for 45 years, and there are literally thousands of pages of his teachings written down in the Pali Canon and other canons. Since these canons were not compiled until centuries after Buddha's death, it's just as hard to reconstruct what he actually taught as it is to reconstruct what Socrates or Jesus taught. The written teachings that have come down to us have come down in a number of languages, all of which differ from the language originally spoken by the Buddha. As Malloy writes, at the core of what is generally regarded as the basic teaching of Buddhism are the three jewels, which are, as in the prayer for refuge, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Buddha's emphasis was ethics, or the practical dimensions of how to live properly a good life. 
and that he avoided unanswerable questions or idle speculations, although we're not really sure this is true. Certainly, one of the most important questions for the Buddha is how to minimize suffering and how to attain inner peace. Metaphysically speaking, the core and most remembered doctrine of the Buddha is known as interdependent origination. That is, the coming into existence of everything within the world depends on every other thing. One cannot will any one thing in the chain of becoming or samsara to cease to exist without wishing the whole chain to cease to exist. And no thing has any independent identity or existence except through its interdependent origination along with everything else. Framed this way, the Buddha's key metaphysical teaching is the thought of ceaseless becoming. The difference here between Buddhist becoming and Western variants such as the doctrine of becoming in Heraclitus is that becoming can in fact come to an end under certain conditions. The cessation of becoming does not mean the permanent achievement of being, but rather the transcendence of existence itself. Nirvana meaning the extinguishing of the flame of life and desire, and thus a kind of blissful return to nothingness, insofar as the term bliss within the experience of nothingness makes any sense. More on that in a moment. The three permanent marks of existence or becoming for the Buddha are impermanence, everything that comes to be passes, suffering, whatever lives suffers, and most controversially that there is no self, anatman, a clear reversal of the teachings of the Upanishads. From these first essential teachings alone, it already occurs to us to wonder whether Buddhism at its inception is more of a philosophy or more of a religion. Certainly it becomes a major world religion with many branches many of them returning to less austere conceptions of reality and the religious life. But in the form of the teaching of the Buddha and the Pali Canon, what will come to be known as Theravada Buddhism in its earliest forms, Buddhism as an ascetic, both life-denying and life-embracing philosophy, sounds a lot more like a philosophical way of life and conception of the overall character of the world than what we normally recognize as a religion. In fact, what Buddha teaches in this doctrine is precisely the opposite of what most religions promise. What is usually promised is permanence, the eternity of the soul in heaven, an end to suffering and attainment of eternal bliss, and becoming who you truly are, a forever homecoming into the true nature of the eternal soul or self. As a religion, the three marks of existence already seem to be an anti-religion in the way we normally understand religion. How many people do you know who make it the principle of their philosophical religion to deny permanence, eternal bliss, and the very existence of a soul beyond the body. The Buddha not only rejected the Hindu notion of a timeless, unchanging reality or Atman Brahman underlying everything, he even denied the gods. Buddhism is often called transtheistic for this reason, because although it does not necessarily deny the existence of gods, it is the furthest possible from positing their importance, but rather sees them, like everything else, from out of the three marks of existence. Is early Buddhism, according to these doctrines, therefore a pessimism? Certainly yes, but it is not quite a skepticism or cynicism. We are deluded by much and must learn to rethink ourselves and to remake our lives. Only then can nirvana enlightenment be attained. The path of attaining this enlightenment is known as the Four Noble Truths. Suffering is inherent to life. There is no way to put an end to desire and suffering, so long as life and desire are. The best that can be accomplished is the Noble Eightfold Path which will limit life's suffering and desire and prepare us for the end of both in nirvana. Buddhism thus emerges as a metaphysical doctrine rooted in ethics, and much of its teachings is concerned with how to cultivate right view, intention, speech, action, livelihood, effort, mindfulness, and concentration. The textbook helpfully points out how subsequent interpreters divided the Eightfold Path into three groups. Morality, entailing speech, action, and livelihood, meditation, involving effort, mindfulness, and concentration, and insight or wisdom, prana, entailing proper view and thought. And notes that spiritual progress within Buddhism is thus distributed across the community. 95% of good Buddhists today attempting to practice right speech, action, and livelihood, only 5% being generally devoted to their meditation practice, mindfulness, concentration, and effort. And only 1%, usually the monks, being committed to the path of prana, right view, right intention, and thus closest to nirvana. Alongside the doctrine of no self or an atman, Buddhist philosophy also has a complex doctrine of personal identity involving five aggregates or skandhas, 
Each individual person is a collection of skandhas. First, the physical body, which is made up of the four elements. Next, the feelings that arise from sensory contact. Third, the perceptions that attach to these categories like good, evil, or neutral. Fourth, our mental habits or samkaras, which are connected to the karma producing will to action. And fifth, the consciousness that arises when mind and body come into contact with the world. Buddha's teaching on karma is uncertain. It seems clear that one's karma brings about a new life, a new combination of skandhas. And early Buddhists often worried about how negative karma in this life might impact future rebirth in accordance with the skandhas. The key to understanding the relation of karma, samsara, or rebirth, nirvana, and the gods in Buddhism is to attain a deeper understanding of the doctrine of dependent origination. Here you see a stunning diagram of exactly how dependent origination works in more detail from the perspective of the living individual. Anyone interested might pause here and study this diagram in some detail. Notice first the outer ring or the normal course of life involving three points of connection between the individual and karma, the first connection, second and third. At the center is the no-self or an-atman, in the first instance experiencing itself as an atman and thus defined by time or the past, present and future. The past is the active side of life because it still has an impact on what we become from its basis. We become on the basis of the past both in our ignorance and in our activity. The past is always the past for a present, and the present is always in the first instance a rebirth consciousness, a specific relation of mind and matter, specific combination of the five senses and the sixth one, insight, phasing of these experiences, as well as a feeling for the future. This is the passive side of life in the present. In the second connection, we crave, seek attachment, and plan our actions. Within the present, that is the stream of becoming. It is this active side of life which produces karma, not what we were, but what we choose to do in the present and how that impacts our dependent origination. After the basis of any action is complete, we enter the third connection, that is the arrival of the future, which is again the passive side of life, since we can never fully anticipate it. The future always involves birth as well as decay and death before we know it thrusting us again into the past and thus into ignorance and activity. The Atman renews itself in the cycle of samsara and the Anatman is not released according to interdependent origination. Heidegger often said when discussing Buddhism that its doctrine of temporal becoming is in fact extremely advanced. You can see clear evidence of that just in this diagram alone. The ascetic tendency of Buddhism is underlined in its concept of nirvana or enlightenment as an extinguishing of desire and suffering. The bliss of undifferentiated becoming may be a good or being itself beyond description and even a bliss, but beyond that, there is nothing. Also, the Buddha's doctrine on the gods is unclear. Little was said about them, for like the peaceful and the wrathful deities of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the gods in themselves know nothing of the end of suffering, only the constant transformation of forms. What is clearer as to the influence of Hinduism on Buddhism is the doctrine of Ahimsa, to do no harm to other living creatures, as well as Karuna, to cultivate compassion for all that lives. Clearly, rebirth happens according to karma, and in most subsequent branches of Buddhism, good karma brings about good births and good events. But in rejecting the independent existence of a soul, explaining how karma works becomes metaphysically more difficult in Buddhism perhaps implying that it is not ourselves which are reborn when we fail to attain nirvana in this life, but rather our qualities, or the constellations of our attachment. Buddhism, like Hinduism, also emphasizes this notion of samsara, a constant cycle of deep pain and decay. And liberation from samsara or nirvana is highly comparable to the Hindu goal of moksha. This is neither in Hinduism nor Buddhism a psychological state of merely having attained peace and equanimity but rather a properly eschatological destination. Here you see a map of some of the sacred sites in the early history of Buddhism. There the Bodhigaya, or the Bodhi Tree, which you can still visit today. There Lumbini, the birthplace of Buddhism, and many other sites of major sermons of the Buddha and of the early spread of Buddhism. Covering the historical spread and transformations of Buddhism in its various branches, from both a socio-political as well as a philosophical and cultural perspective, is such an enormous topic that it would be the subject of its own course. Attempting that here would leave us no time to discuss spirit and nature of contemporary engaged Buddhism. 
but very schematically, Buddhist communities or Sanghas were able to spread effectively after the death of the Buddha because of the superior way of life they offered. Buddhist monastic communities were very popular and supported through a patronage system, going back to wealthy householders who sought both Buddhist insight and the elimination of bad karma through their patronage. Early councils of leaders in the Buddhist community never quite cohered on a single set of canonical texts and doctrines. Although the differences can often seem minor, Buddhism in this way retained as it spread and transformed its status as a religion of free thinkers. The earliest form of Buddhism rooted in the Pali Canon or Theravada Buddhism is known as the Way of the Elders and is the only surviving branch of Buddhism from its earliest period of history. In Theravada Buddhism, the perfect person is an arhat, someone qualified to spread Buddhist teaching through his own personal enlightenment. Today, Theravada Buddhism is the dominant form in Sri Lanka, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, and Burma, and continues to emphasize the individual's effort to seek an end to suffering, emphasizing monasticism and becoming an arhat, and is sometimes also called Hinayana Buddhism or Little Vehicle Buddhism, and tends to be conservative and monastic in focus. The most major spread of Buddhism only occurring centuries after his death when Ashoka, a great king, conquered and converted much of the Asian world to Buddhism. The line between philosophy and religion within Buddhism was often crossed through its expansion, above all in Mahayana or what's known as Big Vehicle Buddhism, which is more concentrated in East Asia and the North. Originally, Bodhisattva had been a term used to refer to the Buddha in the lives he lived prior to enlightenment. But in Mahayana Buddhism, it becomes a general term for all those who have taken the Bodhisattva vow, that is, to continually rebirth and to assist others until all are enlightened. There are a large number of very well-established and fascinating schools of Buddhism within Mahayana, and many of the most eminent philosophers across the history of Buddhist philosophy were Mahayana Buddhists. Culturally, we can see in Mahayana Buddhism an emphasis on religious experience and an explosion of beautiful iconography artistic and cultural forms. Mahayana might be compared in some ways to the mystical branch of Buddhism. And in this case, it really did become the dominant form of Buddhism and appealed most to the laity. It was not, however, without its great philosophers. The Lotus Sutra is often taken to be the most important document or credo of Mahayana Buddhism as a whole and emphasizes the duty of all Buddhists never to give up until all living creatures attain enlightenment or nirvana. Alongside the Lotus Sutra, other key Mahayana texts include the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, the Lakavatara Sutras, and the Pure Land Sutras. Here you see a Tibetan Tanka painting of the Bodhisattva of Compassion, religious imagery and experiences having to do with the gods, the peaceful or the wrathful deities, and the ideal Buddhist as a Bodhisattva, or Buddhist angel who returned to this incarnation from out of Nirvana precisely to complete the task of the salvation of all humanity are themes that run across Mahayana Buddhism. Major schools include Madhyamaka and the famous philosopher Nagarjuna, probably the most engaged with philosopher by European thought in recent decades, as well as the consciousness only school or Sita Matra, the Buddha nature school. During this period as well, messianic emphasis on the second coming of the Buddha or Maitreya, the kind one, and thus a kind of Buddhistic apocalypticism. It was also developed, Maitreya becoming Kuan Yin in the Chinese traditions. And next, Pure Land Buddhism arose in India around 300 CE, as well as the Chan or Zen school around 600 CE. All these branches of Mahayana Buddhism are extremely rich and interesting and worth studying in all their aspects. For our purposes, it must suffice to underline the three body doctrine or Trikaya doctrine and how it developed in Mahayana is the Dharmakaya or cosmic Buddha nature, that is the law body or the form body, the body of reality, which is comparable to the Brahman of Hinduism. Then there is the Nirmanakaya, that is the physical embodiment of Buddha nature above all in Siddhartha Gautama, who is considered an incarnation of the Dharmakaya, much as Vishnu incarnates as various humans, animals, or other divine figures such as Krishna in Hinduism. So the Nirmanakaya, or Siddhartha Gautama, as the transformation body, is the most perfect incarnation of the Dharmakaya, but there may be others and other arrivals of the Buddha in other forms. And third, there is the Sambhogakaya Buddha, or the perfect bliss body, imagined to exist in a pure Buddha land, and sometimes named Amitabha Buddha, presiding over a place where devout Buddhists are reborn, so that they can practice enlightenment after death, in a garden-like world full of heavenly bodhisattvas, a realm frequently depicted in Mahayana art. 
Taken together, the Dharmakaya, the Nirmanakaya, and the Sambhogakaya, the Buddha nature, the Buddha body, and the Buddha spirit, constitute the Buddhist trinity. In a way, thinking in Western terms, God is the Buddha nature. The Son or Christ, the Buddha himself, and the Holy Spirit is the pure perfect bliss body of the Amitabha Buddha that is experienced by a multiplicity of heavenly bodhisattvas. The iconographical resources here are extremely rich. One can see the appeal of Mahayana Buddhism to the average Buddhist practitioner who may have been scared off by some of the extreme austerities of the way of Theravada. Two other key Mahayana philosophical doctrines include Shunyata, the idea that reality itself is empty, Shunya, or zero, nothing, and that the task of the Buddhist meditator is to experience the plenum or wholeness of the world in its play from the perspective of Shunyata. And secondly, Tathata means thatness or suchness and is adapted from the Upanishads and its teaching, That Art Thou. Zen Mahayana Buddhism, a development from the Chen school, is the most widely known in the West. And within it, we get many key terms, common usage when discussing Zen Buddhism, such as their name for enlightenment, Satori, as opposed to Nirvana, as well as the practice of sitting meditation, Zazen, as well as the idea of the Buddhist koan. That is a short enigmatic text used in meditation and to teach logic and spirituality. The next branch of Buddhism is Vajrayana Buddhism or Diamond Vehicle or Vehicle of the Lightning Bolt. This is often considered as a special form of Mahayana Buddhism and has definitely developed its own forms and sacred texts over the centuries. It's often noted that Vajrayana Buddhism involves fusing original Theravada Buddhism and elements of Mahayana Buddhism with indigenous rituals and pagan beliefs, shamanistic rituals involving sacrifice, the use of bones or divination, dance or magical incantations. Tibetan Buddhism is from the Vajrayana line. The globalization of the teachings of the Dalai Lama is actually part of the globalization of Vajrayana Buddhism. And it's within Vajrayana Buddhism that there is developed Tantric Buddhism and its complex methodologies and rich religious experiences. Vajrayana Buddhism was influenced by Hindu Tantric texts and invented its own Tantric lineage. And so the Vajrayana Canon includes the Pali Canon as well as Buddhist Tantras as well as secret, hidden or esoteric texts. The Tibetan Book of the Dead is the most well-known and widely read of the Vajrayana Buddhist texts. And you can watch an excellent documentary on the Tibetan Book of the Dead narrated by Leonard Cohen in the modules this week. Common to all three main branches of Buddhism are these key concepts, samsara, nirvana, dukkha or suffering, dharma and sangha, although they have different and often complex relations to the ritual elements of Buddhism, along with their own rich associated traditions, especially in regards to mantras, sacred chants, mudras, specific hand gestures, mandalas and other forms of sacred art like sand painting or murals, and many other specific differences. If you've watched the show House of Cards, We'll have seen interesting episodes where a legation of Tibetan monks lived in the White House for a bit, making sand paintings, which are cosmic diagrams emphasizing both the perfection of the individual as well as impermanence. As soon as the sand painting is complete, it is brushed away, the multicolored sand being offered to a flowing stream like a river or into the windy air. Here you see a map of the diffusion of the various forms of Buddhism across Asia, Buddhism eventually becoming in the modern period the fourth largest world religion with large populations across all of these countries and now also in Europe and the Americas. With some intermittencies due to colonization by Islam and hostility from Hindus and other cultural complexities, main pilgrimage sites for Buddhists continued to be in the 21st century, the site of Buddha's birth, of his enlightenment, Bodhigaya tree, of his first sermon in Deer Park, as well as the site of his death. And like in Catholicism, there are many relics of Buddha and of Buddhist saints. And if you end up getting interested in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, I particularly recommend still the Evans Wentz translation with the introduction by Carl Jung. This text in particular is so fascinating because it describes the rituals which the Lama performs for days and weeks over the body of the deceased, attempting to help the soul of the person re-dissolve into the primary clear light of the good, that is the Nirvana, beyond the secondary clear light of differentiation in the forms and before descending into the bardos which involved the complex and intertwined revelations of the peaceful and the wrathful deities in both their difference and unity before the soul who fails to center itself on the primary clear light of the good is wrapped up in specific constellations of divine and demonic energy before entering their next rebirth. The Council of Tibetan Lamas 
is in fact responsible for locating the soul of the Dalai Lama as it undergoes these transmigrations. Before we move on to Buddhism and modernity, spirit, nature, and ecology in contemporary Buddhism, here's a little intermission of a song written by actually my ex-wife, Twilight and Bardo, when we were studying the Tibetan Book of the Dead. After the intermission, we'll be covering the greening of Buddhism and contemporary interactions of Buddhist and Western philosophy. Welcome back, I hope you accessed the Great Perpendicular. Although I guess you didn't remain in the primary clear light of the good since you're back. Don't worry, we'll overcome samsara together. Together now, through a closer study of spirit, nature, and ecology in Buddhism. As usual, Nasir on the status of the concept of nature and order, or nature and spirit in Buddhism is very succinct and helpful. He begins by noting that the emphasis on attaining nirvana might lead one to suspect that there is little emphasis on the value, order, or spirituality of nature in Buddhism, this is a mistake. The Buddha himself is described as a tathgata, that is, one of those who have realized the nature of things or their suchness. 
Furthermore, Dharma is both religion and the universal order or natural law by which the world or samsara functions. Indeed, the Buddha did not create or originate Dharma, but discovered and revealed it. And the Pali Canon consistently portrays him as a discoverer of the order of Dhamma, the universal logic, philosophy, or righteousness in which rational and ethical elements are fused into one. In other words, the Buddha is very much, and perhaps above all, a thinker of the order in nature. And this is precisely the import of the doctrine of nature as dependent origination. In Mahayana, Dharma came to signify both the imminent and transcendent reality of all things, perfectly revealed in the Buddhist teaching and elucidating the universal order of nature, as well as our path towards deliverance from samsaric existence. Nasir interprets the Buddhist doctrine of constant becoming or dependent origination as anti-Aristotelian. There are no substances, but only modalities. And the world is not constituted as a series of substances, but as a flux of the dharmas. This flux, however, is not chaotic or incoherent, but follows strictly the law of dependent origination. Brushing over lightly the many debates within Buddhism about the structure, number, and interrelation among the natural dharmas, Nasir points out how in Mahayana doctrine the dharmas are done away with altogether. Dharma or ultimate reality becoming the eternal body or dharmakaya of the Buddha. That is the father in the Western Trinity and the foundational dimension of the Buddhist Trinity. This dharmic understanding of nature is richly developed in the writings of Dogen, who after Nagarjuna is probably the most important figure to study and read in his primary sources to really understand the philosophy behind Buddhism. Before Dogen, Kukai was the first to bring the teachings of the Buddha to Japan, and he understood ultimate Buddha as Buddha nature that shines like a great light within all things. Under the influence of Buddhism, the Japanese Shinto Kami became the Gohoshin, or the god guardians of Dharma, and thus included in the Japanese pantheon. Dozen as well as Vajrayana Buddhism includes shamanistic elements rooted in indigenous beliefs. Notice in the case of Buddhism, the synthesis of pre-existing religious and spiritual elements in the indigenous cultures does not occur through colonization and domination, but rather conversation and sublimation. Nasir writes, in the context of Japan, Buddhism was in fact not world-denying, but manifested itself in the world of nature. Zen Buddhist Japanese scholars have often spoken about the selfific or soteriological function of nature and seen this as fully consistent with their Buddhism. Various other strands of Buddhism spoke of the Buddhahood of the elements of nature themselves, such as plants or trees, your favorite plant, tree, or pet, in fact instantiating all three dimensions of the Buddhist trinity. So Buddhism in this sense, with its thought of dependent origination, is actually closer to the spiritual essence or Buddhahood in all things, and is decisively non-anthropocentric. If the Buddha nature, Buddha body, and bliss body exist perfectly in the lotus flower and in the sacred axis mundi tree, then there can be no basis within Buddhism to emphasize human salvation over the salvation of all of samsaric existence. Nasir thus notes that the dharmas of the natural world and of human beings are not alien or distinct realities, but belong to the exact self-same order of understanding that is the very meaning of the dharma. Truth, principle, law, our duty to act and live according to the law is not ours alone as human beings, but is shared by every being in the cycle of becoming. Thanks again, Nasir, pretty decisive on the status of nature and spirit in Buddhism. Our next stop is the greening of Buddhism, its promise and perils, an article in the Oxford Handbook of Religion and Ecology by Stephanie Kaza. Kaza begins by noting the development of green Buddhism is a relatively new phenomena reflecting the scale of the environmental crisis globally. And she also underlines that one of the earliest voices for Buddhist environmentalism in North America was the Zen student and poet Gary Snyder, who illuminated the connections between Buddhist practice and ecological thinking. Yes, this is the same Gary Snyder who wrote the course on religion and ecology and taught it at UC Davis for many years. The same Gary Snyder who had a conversation with the Crow Elder on how us modern Americans should stay put long enough to communicate with the spirits of the land again. And the very one whose poem cycle, Turtle Island, 
I found in a first edition in Mendocino while designing this course. And he still lives there up in Nizendo, not very far from where I speak. What would he think about all the pushback I've been receiving from CSUS students about the rigor and difficulty of my course on spirit and nature, given that his own anthology for the purposes of that course spanned over four volumes? This same Gary Snyder is literally the path-breaking pioneer of the field of greening Buddhism in the contexts of religious studies and ecology, and we will meet him again later in the course. Kaza reminds us that Snyder studied Zen in Japan and cultivated an in-the-moment haiku-like form to his poetry, much of which was set in the mountains of the Western United States. He was also associated with the early beat generation of the 50s and 60s and had a strong influence on the counterculture at that time. Hippies, communards, and back-to-the-landers took up Snyder's approach. What they had read in Jack Kerouac's travel logs, Dharma Bums, was just not enough. They needed Snyder to bring it home. And there are now doctoral programs in the United States where a student can earn a graduate degree with a focus on Buddhism and ecology. This is in large part thanks to Gary Snyder. And while we're on the subject of Gary Snyder, let me say that my own personal mentor, Dale Pendel, another important historical figure and writer in Northern California, was also a practicing Zen Buddhist priest. That guy seemed to know everything about everything, pretty much. And he used to get very worried about me at the beginning of my teaching career when I explained the types of reactions I was getting from students for actually teaching them very important and interesting things. Unfortunately, Dale is past now, but Gary still lives. I think you owe him a little respect. Hopefully that respect can transfer just enough onto me so that you actually learn what's important to learn from this class. And don't just see it as, oh, what a great difficulty, I have to read an article. In the emerging field of greening Buddhism spearheaded by Snyder, by the 1980s, Buddhist leaders were explicitly addressing the eco-crisis and incorporating ecological awareness into their teachings. In his 1989 Nobel Peace Prize speech, His Holiness the Dalai Lama proposed making Tibet an international ecological reserve. And Vietnamese and monk and peace activist Thich Nhat Hanh invited his followers to join the Order of Interbeing, teaching Buddhist principles using ecological examples. Widespread interest in Buddhist views on the environment gained momentum in the 90s through numerous books, journals, and conferences. So in many ways, the green aspects of Buddhism were the cutting edge in ecology and religion studies for quite a while. And for the 20th anniversary of Earth Day, the Buddhist Peace Fellowship produced a teaching packet and poster for widespread distribution. Buddhism in the late 20th and early 21st century is a greening phenomenon. Next, in 1990, there were two groundbreaking national conferences held in Seattle, Washington, and Vermont, both focusing on an eco-religious approach to the environment. At the Vermont conference, the Dalai Lama was the keynote speaker, urging people to take care of the world. And a few years later, in 1993, at the Parliament of the World of Religions in Chicago, Buddhists gathered with Hindus, Muslims, pagans, Jews, and Christians from all over the world. The drawback of this 1990 scholarship is that it tended to address the philosophy of Buddhism. The emphasis on practice began in earnest with the Buddhist teacher Thich Nhat Hanh and Bernie Glassman. Early important publications in Buddhist environmental thought include Dharma Gaya, 1990, Buddhism and Ecology, in 1997, and Dharma Reign in 2000. One of the questions Kasa asks is why Buddhism is so perennially appealing to Americans. Telling that story in itself is a long history. Buddhism, for one reason or another, has held a magnetic attraction as the exotic other next to Christianity. A fully developed and fully philosophical religion whose emphasis is free thinking and enlightenment and never conformity to established beliefs. Many young people since the 70s, 80s, and 90s who are concerned about the environment find in Buddhism a congruent spiritual fit and find Buddhist environmental thought very appealing. And at the professional level, Buddhist perspectives have been pathbreakers at programs nationwide, such as the Religion and Ecology Group, organized by the American Academy of Religion. So far, according to Kaza, although her article is a bit dated now, Climate change and areas of environmentalism requiring technical knowledge are not frequently covered in Buddhism and ecology literature. The Buddhist ecology literature does, however, offer rich resources for immediate application in food ethics, animal rights, and consumerism. Food ethics are evolving rapidly in the West as consumers realize the tremendous cost of globally shipped goods and agriculture based on chemical inputs. 
I also teach for CSUS the, the food farming and the sacred class, in which you read Michael Pollan and many others on contemporary food ethics. Next, CASA breaks down the themes of ecology and environmental dimensions in the three major branches of Buddhism. In the earliest Buddhist sutras, there are many references to nature as refuge, especially trees and caves. Recall Siddhartha Gautama is born by a tree, changes his path in life towards the middle way at another, and is enlightened at yet another. When he taught, he was always in large gatherings of monks and lay people in protected groves of trees, but served in the region as rainy season retreats. And the Buddha, as far as we know, always chose natural places for meditation, free from the influence of everyday human activity. For Theravada Buddhism, trees are sacred and the lords of the forest. And today in India and Southeast Asia, many large old trees are often wrapped with monastic cloth to indicate age-old appreciation for nature as a refuge. Fully embracing the nature of impermanence means loving nature as a medicine, which helps us overcome our suffering and practice compassion and loving kindness. Many scriptures in Theravada Buddhism recount the former lives of the Buddha as an animal or tree, even in those forms showing compassion for everything that suffers. And the very earliest guidelines for monks in the Vinaya community contained multiple admonitions related to care for the environment. Here, both influenced by and influencing Hindu and Jain principles of Ahimsa, one of the eight practice spokes for being a good Buddhist is right conduct, based on the principle of non-harm. And this is one of those that applies to all Buddhists, not just the great meditators and knowers. In fact, each of the eight spokes of the Eightfold Path can be interpreted environmentally. For example, the practice of right view or intention could be understood as understanding the laws of causality and interdependence in nature. According to canonical Theravada teachings, Buddha prohibited five livelihoods, trading in slaves, trading in weapons, selling alcohol, selling poisons, and slaughtering animals. Western, European, imperial, and American culture continue to be founded in all five of these prohibited livelihoods. In Mahayana Buddhism, interdependence and mutual causality is especially emphasized. In the Avatamsaka Sutra Hua Yen school, the very famous metaphor of the jewel net of Indra is used to represent the infinite complexity of the universe. The net of Indra is an imaginary cosmic weave that holds the multifaceted jewels at each of its nodes together with each jewel reflecting all the others. This is the most powerful image and metaphor we have for interdependent origination. If any jewel becomes cloudy, toxic, or polluted, they reflect the others less clearly. And tugs on any of the net lines, for example, through loss of species or habitat fragmentation, affects all the other lines. Likewise, if the clouded jewels clear up, if rivers are cleaned, wetlands restored, etc., then life across the net is enhanced. The net of interdependence includes not only the actions of all beings, but also their thoughts, and the intentions of the actors become a critical factor in determining what happens. The emptiness of the separate self is far from a nihilistic or world-denying doctrine. What it really states is that since all phenomena are dependent on interacting causes and conditions, nothing exists as autonomous or self-supporting. We are locked in an interdependence, wherein, as Gary Snyder suggests, only the empty nature of the self offers access to the wild mind or Buddha nature. Only that which transcends interdependent origination comes to know the energetic forces that determine the nature of life. In Western philosophy, this is known as perspective. The next theme to be richly developed in contemporary contexts from Mahayana Buddhism is the idea of eco-sattvas. Recall the enlightened beings or bodhisattvas who return life after life to help all who suffer. Mahayana Buddhism has a bit of an edge over early Theravada, which emphasized achieving enlightenment and leaving the world of suffering. The northern schools, however, influenced by Confucian social codes, placed great value on becoming enlightened to serve others. The Bodhisattva vow to save all sentient beings calls for cultivating compassion for the endless suffering that arises from the mere fact of existence. Bodhisattvic ethics applied to environmental service in the Anthropocene, an era of climate change means rethinking bodhisattvas as ecosattvas. Recall from earlier in the lecture the Trikaya doctrine of Mahayana Buddhism, 
and note that as a trinity, it is deeply attuned to the relation of spirit, nature, and ecology. The spiritual truth or ultimate reality is the Dharmakaya. This physical embodied nature, the cosmos, is the Nirmanakaya. And the ecological is the interdependency, the interrelation, attaining through Buddhist ethics the perfect bliss body. The many Buddhas or Bodhisattvas and the fulfillment of this world and higher ones, leading to what Christians would call heaven on earth as the culmination of life. Next, Kaza notes how in Vajrayana, there is also bodhisattvic inspiration. One of the great Vajrayana prayers reads, just like space and the great elements such as earth, may I always support the life of all the boundless creatures until they pass away from pain. May I also be the source of life for all the realms of varied beings that reach into the ends of space. Vajrayana Buddhism often cultivates strong connections to the land. Monks and others for many centuries have gone on pilgrimage to specific mountains to demonstrate their spiritual devotion, sometimes taking years to complete the journey. And stupas or reliquary shrines in the Vajrayana sanctuaries are placed at significant points on the land to draw energy and commemorate important leaders. Pilgrims make offerings at these sites, linking the points of energy across the landscape with their own footsteps. The poster boy of engaged Buddhism is Thich Nhat Hanh, who notes that interbeing has become popular among Western Buddhists as a way to express the dynamic sense of our relationship with the earth. And he frequently teaches about interbeing through the example of a piece of paper which holds the sun, the earth, the clouds, and all the beings of the forest. Not only in the act of representing them on that paper as, say, in a painting, but also simply in virtue of the fact of being paper. Next time you write a journal entry in the old-fashioned way on a piece of paper, realize with the Nan Han that the sun, the earth, the clouds, and all the beings of the forest are with you. Not just spiritually in what you represent, but physically right there before you, the paper itself. Kasa also notes some limitation and critical aporias in the task of greening Buddhism. For Buddhism is not a nature religion per se, and in this way it differs from pagan or Native American traditions which rest their spiritual understanding on the land and all living beings. Rather, the central principles of Buddhism deal with human suffering and liberation from suffering. Although when we extend this to the suffering of animals and plants, can we speak of a plant suffering? We may be tempted again to think that Buddhism is just as anthropocentric as Christianity. Its process of insight, nirvana, is not dependent on the land or any physical form, but more of a mental process, cultivating capacities in the human being. In this sense, Buddhism, like Christianity, does not immediately lend itself to environmental concerns. Furthermore, despite the promising developments noticed above, the Buddhist environmental movement has not coalesced around the globe. While vocal, there are only a tiny handful of organizations that have been formed to promote Buddhist environmental views and approaches. And there has been no clearly defined environmental agenda or set of principles agreed upon by any group of self-identified green Buddhists. Is this too much to expect from a fledgling movement? Casa suspects it will be 10 years at least and many more books before Buddhist environmental concerns become the concerns of global Buddhism. Lastly this week, I wanted to briefly cover the philosophical interactions of Buddhism and Western philosophy and the philosopher Martin Heidegger. Many great scholars in the Heideggerian tradition have explored the relationship between Heidegger and Eastern philosophy, not only Buddhism, but also and especially Taoism, and sometimes also, but more marginally, Hinduism. It's very easy from within the Western legacy to just consider Heidegger as one philosopher among others and also to dismiss his thought because of his troubling political involvement with the Nazis in the 1930s. Actually, Heidegger's path through Western philosophy also became increasingly, in the 1950s and beyond, a path through global philosophy. And this later part of Heidegger's philosophical career involved him affirming over and against the idea that humans must be resolute, pull themselves up by their bootstraps, cultivate authenticity and become who they are, that really the best that humans can do is to let beings be, sounds like a John Lennon song. In this entire philosophy rooted in the idea of letting be in German Gelassenheit, we find a fundamental affinity and insight into nothingness that is shared by Heidegger and Buddhism. According to Michael Zimmerman in an early article on the topic, such insight leads to the overcoming of anthropocentrism and dualism. 
any authenticity or enlightenment worthy of the name always concerns our own insight into our own nothingness. In his early thinking, Heidegger had developed a mystical notion of nothingness rooted in Meister Eckhart and Greek philosophy, and according to which time or temporally conditioned existence involves a fundamental absencing or nothingness as well as a presencing and manifesting. This was already long before Heidegger had really studied Buddhism, the thought of impermanence. Furthermore, the passage to authenticity is not a passage to permanence in the self or the ego, but it's the ordeal of exposure to anxiety and the nothing, and the resulting stages of enlightenment and authenticity that followed, just like in the life of the Buddha. In the later Heidegger, humanity will transform itself when it lets beings in the world be, and allows itself to be part of this event of the truth of being, what he calls eragness. Heidegger's eragness, or event of appropriation, is a lot like the Tao and a lot like the Buddha nature. According to Zimmerman, Heidegger and Mahayana Buddhism both cultivate a deconstructive approach to Western metaphysical foundationalism. Heidegger underlines that although East and West live in different houses of being, that is, different languages, they can also cultivate a dialogue. You can see one such attempt at a dialogue in a rare recorded interview between Heidegger and a Buddhist monk in the modules for this week. And there are many other examples. And great Japanese philosophers in the Kyoto school, who either studied with Heidegger in Freiburg and brought Heidegger's thinking back to the East to Zen Buddhism, or who were so taken and impressed with Heidegger's philosophy because it reflected much in their own philosophical traditions they never expected a Westerner to say. For example, within Mahayana Buddhism, all things arise moment by moment without causation, simply from absolute nothingness or sunyata. This is precisely Heidegger's thought to being and the ordeal of nothingness, which always stands before it. Furthermore, the self, ego, or what the West calls Cartesian subjectivity may seem solid, but in Mahayana Buddhism, it is impermanent and empty. Mahayana Buddhists like Nagarjuna emphasize that there is no essence, core, or substance to things. It is not only human beings who are anatman, but things as well. This is exactly how Heidegger and also Nietzsche often think in their struggles with the Aristotelian tradition of understanding being a substance. For both Heidegger and Mahayana Buddhism, when we no longer experience the world dualistically in subject-object metaphysics, we become open to the momentary manifestation of interrelated phenomena. For Buddhism, ultimately there is no difference between nirvana and samsara. The nothingness of the phenomenal world of suffering is the same in the end as the nothingness of nirvana. And thus form is emptiness and emptiness is form. In Zen Buddhism, this leads to the extraordinary form of laughter that often accompanies satori or enlightenment. And it's also a laughter that you can find in both Nietzsche and Heidegger's critique of the concept of form in Western metaphysics. Next, for Zimmerman, according to Mahayana Buddhism, the Buddha opposed the traditional doctrines of the Upanishads and the Vedas, according to which eternal Atman, the unchanging divine self, permeates and sustains things by constituting their ultimate essence, their true self. Thus, for Buddhism, suffering only ends when we overcome dualism and cease to cling to the illusory ego or the self. Accordingly, only some rare brands of Theravada can truly be considered world-denying. That is, very few Buddhists across its long history have truly privileged the encounter with Nirvana. Rather, the vast majority of Buddhists have affirmed the need to save all beings, to protect nature and each other from our own abuse. Oddly, Buddhism is more or less where the later Heidegger winds up. Through his encounters with poetry and later with Eastern thought, he reconceives authenticity, becoming who you are, knowing who you are, in terms of Gelassenheit, releasement from willing. Salvation involves becoming the nothingness we already are. And Zen's emphasis on sitting meditation and koans resembles Heideggerian meditation on pre-Socratic fragments. For both Heidegger and Buddhism, reality is always a co-production, a dance of the earth and the sky, of the mortals and the divine, into both manifestation and disappearance. Heidegger and Buddhism thus both provide phenomenalisms of cosmic co-production that is emphasizing our roles in the cycles of interdependent origination. In conclusion, according to Zimmerman, unlike reform environmentalism, deep ecology 
argues that only a transformation of Western anthropocentrism, the humanity-nature dualism, can save the biosphere from destruction. This accords very much with White. Heidegger and Mahayana Buddhism both have rich resources for non-anthropocentric thinking and how to let beings be. Each promotes their own version of ontological phenomenalism. And even one of the leading Norwegian deep ecologists, Arne Nass, has been deeply influenced by both Heidegger and Mahayana Buddhism and drawn similar connections. Buddhist karuna or compassion and Heideggerian care or sorga can also be thought together. The danger, however, at the fringes of Heideggerian and Buddhist thought is always again the same, not eco-satvism, but eco-fascism. And the idea of individuals sacrificing themselves for the organic whole. This is something visible today in global Buddhist communities such as at Myanmar. Zimmerman concludes there are anthropocentric limits in Heidegger as well as in Buddhism, such as on the insistence of unique human beings or the insistence of human beings' path to nirvana. Nevertheless, Zen Buddhists, especially from the Kyoto school, continue to criticize while learning well from the limits of Heidegger's thinking of nothingness. Okay, always much more to say, but that's your introduction to the history of Buddhism and the themes of spirit, nature, and ecology in Buddhism. Um, I look forward to seeing you next week where we'll cover spirit, nature, and the environment in Confucianism and Taoism. Have a good week.